The title of this piece, being Our Friend Fluid Metal, came after I started working with the elements. I first started collecting these elements several years ago. A guy that I know here in LA who is a wonderful procurer of metal objects. He just has a magnetism, and this is his profession to collect metal objects and to sell them. Started bringing some of these things over to my studio. And I first started looking at them and thinking, God, what weird things, but I can't touch those. And he said, you want more? And I said, yeah, bring more. And then he'd bring more, and I'd looked at them for a couple of years, still not able to touch them. And I was very concerned uh, about them using them as objects for many reasons. Uh, one, their objectness was so irreversible in my mind. They were little playground animals that you know, had very specific pop. And they were, you know, pop objects, popular objects. So much has been done with these pop objects, I thought, that's not for me. But I kept collecting more and more and more of them. So while looking at them and collecting them, I noticed that the really early ones were very, were quite thick. The aluminum on them was really dense. And as time went on, the aluminum started getting a mite bit thinner. Not that much thinner, but a little bit. And I realized, oh, these were made, started making them in the early 50s, late 40s, something like that. I have made a lot of works with airplane parts, aluminum airplane parts. And years ago, when I was collecting those airplane parts, I made friends with this lovely gentleman, Mr. Huffman. And he had mountains of these airplane parts in the Mojave Desert. And every once in a while, he'd crank up his big smelter and his mountains would shrink. He would still have hills or mountains, but they weren't as big. And he'd say, you know, the price of aluminum went up. Uh, at that point in time was the Japanese wanted X amount of tonnage for the, you know, to produce cars at the time, whatever they were producing. And he would melt it down and ship it out. And when I first made friends with him, he um, showed me pictures of himself in the National Geographic with this little mobile smelter that he took throughout the Midwest, throughout the West, and melted down all these fleets of airplanes after World War II. And aluminum is a metal that is much cheaper to recycle than to pull out of the ground. So I'm thinking, why was this profusion of these objects in the early 50s late? And I realized, oh, that's all those airplanes that Mr. Huffman melted down. All those things that had just been melted and remelted, and they could be very thick because aluminum was very cheap, and they, they could be produced in mass quantity to make these little springy things. So I started thinking about just that, the metal, and that the metal, I was kind of catching these things in a certain cusp. They had once been, you know, the airplanes that fought in World War II, who knows what they were before that, if it had been mined right out of the ground, if it had been something that had been melted down. Mm -hmm. And then they became these doodads that I collected. And I was kind of catching them right at the cusp of when they were ready to be melted down again. To me, I saw them as this thing no longer is this pop thing, but it's this thing just caught in this cusp of this kind of movement. And the metal, where was the metal before? It was in the airplanes, it was maybe in the earth. Where, what, how did it get in the earth? It came from stars and things from outer space. So this metal thing isn't just our friend the metal, it is our the friend the metal, it's right there, but it comes from way out there and then it goes into the earth and then we bring it out and it keeps just being changed. I think that that's where the title came from. It, I, I was thinking of this thing in, in flux. It, I'm catching this thing in uh, a moment of flux. I could take that pop element out of them and suddenly they became these oddly abstract things. It almost became a painterly thing. I started thinking more of de Kooning, early Gustin's, when he was an abstract painter, how all those little paisley shaped things of color would lock together. So I started seeing them, rather than a duck or a frog or a turtle or a rocket, as these little wiggly shapes of color. And I think that as I started looking at it, it became this abstract, fluid, grotto-like thing 
and every once in a while an eyeball or a little frog's tail or a little wiggly thing, but it became more of this abstract conglomerate of this fluid, odd form. I feel like I'm kind of a discoverer as I'm working with these materials and finding if it's gonna work or not. Because it's kind of a gamble. You don't know if those new materials you found are gonna just be terrible or if you're gonna figure out a way to get through that terribleness and find a way to make it work for me. I'm not really interested in the work making a, a, a pedantic statement. I'm more interested in finding stuff that excites me as an artist that I want to work with. Maybe if I was around in the 1860s or the 1820s or the 1760s, you know, my material would be really different. We wouldn't have this stuff. But these materials made more sense to me. You know, when I was in art school, there was a wonderful uh, art supply store with beautiful paints and pastels and nice paper. And that wasn't that interesting to me.